Good morning and welcome to the Columbus Metropolitan Club. We're streaming live from the Boathouse at Confluence Park and we're really happy to kick off 2021 with our annual blue chip economic forecast. Uh, my name is Jane Scott and I serve as President and CEO of the Columbus Metropolitan Club and I'm really happy to have you here with us virtually. Uh, it, we're so used to having a room full of people that it's still sad for us not to have you here but we're very grateful that you're watching online. Today's forum is sponsored by BDO and Fifth Third Bank, and I'd like to invite Stephanie Green, the Managing Director of Fifth Third Private Bank, to introduce our speakers. Thank you, Jane, and thank you, Columbus Metropolitan Club. Fifth Third is proud to support the Metropolitan Club as we convene weekly conversations on important community topics. We are better as a community when many come together to discuss the matters of our times. A record stock market looms in stark contrast to the economic reality for many Americans. The global pandemic has caused seismic shifts in consumer behavior. Business is anything but normal. Predicting the future is tricky business, but listening to trusted experts for insight Good data and guidance will aid us as we look ahead. Please join me in welcoming our speakers today. PhD and founder and owner of Regionomics LLC, Mr. Bill Lafayette. Chief Market Strategist and Senior Vice President of Fifth Third Bank, Mr. Tom Jalix. Business Reporter at the Columbus Dispatch, Mr. Mark Williams. And our host, Editor-in-Chief, of Columbus Business First, Doug Buchanan. Bill will start us off with his 2021 forecast, then Doug will lead the conversation. Bill, the stage is yours. Thank you very much, Stephanie, and thank you all for tuning in. Thanks especially to those of you who've bought a virtual seat, and a big thanks to my friends at CMC for making this forecast the first forum of the year now for 20 years. Needless to say, this year is really different, and I miss seeing 400 of you in this room. Let me set the stage for where we're at with a few numbers. 162,000. That's how many jobs the Bureau of Labor Statistics said that Central Ohio lost last March and April. That's a 14.4% decline in two months, almost triple the loss during the entire 2007-2009 recession. 5.9%. That's the year-over-year -year job loss that I think we suffered last year. We got some nice employment gains beginning in May, and there's at least one case where I think the government estimates of our employment are too low. 53,300. That's the number of Central Ohioans who were unemployed and actively searching for work in November. Because of the way it's defined, that's much less than the number who are actually out of work and need and want a job. 1,104, that's the most heartbreaking number of all. That's the number of Central Ohio, Ohioans who have died of COVID as of yesterday, part of Ohio's total of 9,247. That's where we are, a very different place from where we expected to be this time last year. I was predicting slowing growth for 2020 that would cut our net employment gain to 1% from 2019's 1.2%. My forecasts have been wrong before, but certainly never this wrong. In my defense, though, I cautioned, as I do every year, that there is always something that could come up to make things turn out differently. I need to bold face and underline that caution this year because this forecast is even more uncertain than it usually is because we don't know how bad the post-holiday surge 
in infections is going to be, how that's going to affect different industries, how fast vaccinations will occur, how fast those vac vaccinations will bring down the infection rate, how soon people will feel comfortable getting back to normal, and even what normal will look like. All that said, the forecast for 2021 is for a total year-over-year -year gain of 26,800 jobs, or 2.6%. In a normal year, that would be outstanding. But if there's a smooth increase working out to that year-over-year -year gain, at the end of this year, we'll still be about 30,000 jobs short of our February 2020 peak. But please keep in mind, if infections and hospitalizations here get much worse, as they have in California, all bets are off. The leisure and hospitality sector bore the brunt of the employment collapse. This includes arts, entertainment, recreation, hotels, and restaurants. In the shutdown of March and April, this sector lost half of its total employment. 53,000 jobs vaporized in two months. It's made back half of that loss in the following months, so we're now down about one quarter from its level last February. I'm predicting a 4.6% gain for this year. If we get that, we'll be down only about 15% from the peak at the end of 2020, or in February 2020, excuse me. Arts organizations, though, are under terrible pressure, and we've lost a bunch of restaurants over the last year that won't be coming back. Most of those restaurants were locally owned. Losing these has a whole host of negative impacts. These restaurants represented the owner's livelihoods, their passion, and often their life savings. So these closures represent a personal tragedy. The community has lost some of what made us unique. We're now a little less like ourselves and a little more like everywhere else. From an economic standpoint, Locally owned, locally serving retail and restaurants and other businesses trap spending and recirculate it in the local economy. This sustains additional jobs, income, and economic activity here in central Ohio. Dollars spent at chains, on the other hand, leak out to the chain's distant headquarters, so they have less than half the impact on the central Ohio economy as a locally owned business has. With a greater concentration of chains, the local impact of spending in total is less. Our economy becomes leakier and our economic growth is less than it would be otherwise. There are many small businesses and small nonprofits in other sectors that are also struggling. It's going to be a while before we get the full story of what this time has done to them. The forecast has a quick discussion of each sector. It was sent out to everybody who registered. It's on the Columbus Metropolitan Club web website, columbusmetroclub.org, under the News tab. And you can also get it on the Regionomics website, which is regionomicsllc.com. I want to wrap up with some thoughts on a couple other sectors that there wasn't the space to talk about in the document. State government was flat here, but it was down almost 10 percent across Ohio. The culprit here and elsewhere was state colleges and universities. Those jobs were down 8 percent here and almost 15 percent statewide. Every institution is hurting. Many are enacting budget cuts, furloughs, eliminating departments, and laying off staff and even tenured faculty. When I wanted to be a tenured fac faculty member, I thought that job would be good for life. 
outside of education, state government employment was up 6.5% here, but down 1.3% statewide. That constitutes a 30, or continues a 30 year trend of the state increasing the share of state government jobs in central Ohio. Like leisure, retail has been under considerable pressure, but that was true even before employment collapsed, and Columbus was in underperforming even relative to that. So we fell 11% instead of the 15% national average in March and April, and increased 7% instead of 14% since then. I'm predicting a 2.2% net gain in retail for 2021. Now I've only scratched the surface of what's going on in the local economy and haven't even mentioned the housing crisis and other impacts of the pandemic. Some of that we're going to talk about in our conversation. Clearly, we must take COVID seriously. We have to stay distant, we have to stay home and as much as, much as we can and we have to mask up. What we say around my house is that we would rather miss you for a while than miss you forever. So thanks again for watching. I wish us all a happier 2021. Stay healthy and take care of one another. Doug, we are now in your hands. All right, thank you, Bill. Um, I'm Doug Buchanan, I'm editor with Columbus Business First. Um, I've uh, enjoyed your economic forecast for several years, and uh, let me just say, I still have complete confidence in you, Bill, despite how badly you missed last year's forecast, okay? Just, just put that out there. Um, <clears throat> nobody's blaming you, however. Uh, I want to talk about a couple of specific industries real quick. You did mention the leisure and hospitality and this concept of leaking, but can you go back on that? Because I know you've talked about this for years, the importance of shopping for small business and how much of that money is captured. Can you go into mm -hmm. specifics about that? Sure. Uh, small businesses buy from local suppliers. Uh, that spending sustains jobs and income here in central Ohio. Chains, on the other hand, centralize their purchasing and business services in order to be efficient. And so the impact of those purchases occurs, but it occurs somewhere else, wherever the headquarters happen to be. We rank 85th out of 100 in the share of all workers who are self-employed and 86th in the share of all firms with fewer than 20 employees, that out of the 100 largest metro areas in the US. So we were in rough shape before COVID hit. We are in rougher shape now. Our economy becomes leakier. The impact of the dollars that we spend here in central Ohio becomes less. And it's something I'm very worried about. Mm -hmm. I know you talked about that for, for, I mean, I've heard you talk about oh, that for many years, and I felt like we were making progress, and now we've uh, regressed with this. Another one was health care. Uh, it's been in the spotlight all year, obviously, uh, humongous uh, you know, demand from, from COVID, but the employment was actually down. How do you explain that one? Well, that comes from the reduction in elective procedures. Uh, originally, those elective procedures were disallowed, and now uh, they're down because some people are still nervous about going into an office when it's, abs when it's not absolutely necessary. Um, and there's a skills mismatch uh, when you look at what's needed in hospitals and what's available out in the market. Uh, you can't necessarily transfer all these employees from uh, wherever they're employed to hospitals. Uh, a dental hygienist, for example, or a chiropractor wouldn't be particularly helpful in an ICU. Okay, uh, let's look ahead to 2021 then as part of your forecast. One of the fastest growing industries that you have for 2021 is something called administrative support and waste services. Can you explain that? Well, we don't really know for sure yet, but uh, it's probably due to an increase in demand for temporary employees. Uh, every temporary employee, regardless of where she or he works, 
is classified in this industry. A way, it, it, it's really for the employer a way of dealing with uncertainty. Um, if you see uh, your business increasing, if you need people, but you're not confident that your growth's going to con continue, uh, hiring temp workers is an answer in, in at least some cases. Now that's only one of the three segments of business services, and it's the only segment that's doing really well. Uh, professional services underperformed throughout the expansion, um, and employment in corporate headquarters has been flat for years. Obviously, we don't really know what's gonna happen now, but I am expecting, guessing, if you will, that uh, it's going to continue to underperform as we go forward. Right. Uh, those are key parts of our economy, and I'm really worried about them. Yeah, yeah, and they're, and they're growing. Tom and Mark, let's bring you into the conversation. Tom, um, it's not just temp work, but it's remote work. And I think both of them are changing the way that we work. What are the economic implications that you can see of that? Well, thanks uh, for the invite. It's wonderful to be here. I appreciate um, the time and effort. And thanks for that very thoughtful um, you know, update on your forecast for 2021. Um, to answer your question directly, I think you know, we've been really taking a look at work from home. Obviously, um, it's been very fortunate that we have the technology uh, that we have in, in, in 2020 uh, to have this mobile workforce. Uh, otherwise, I think the, uh, the unemployment situation would have been almost untenable. Um, you know, we came into 2020 with an unemployment rate at 3.5, 3.6% nationally. That was the lowest unemployment rate uh, since December of 1969. I mean, our economy was doing quite well. And my forecast was, I, I think, similar to Bill's. Like, we did not see a recession last year. Um, you know, we're wrong. Oh, we're wrong. I, I had a mentor a long time ago <laughs> tell me, you're going to get into the economic forecasting business, be ready to be wrong a lot. Um, so that, that was absolutely the case last year. And, you know, we called it an exogenous shock. That's what really the, the virus yeah. and, and, and what happened with, um, you know, in our opinion, at least the government's, uh, um, you know, mandate to shut down all businesses really on March of 12th or 13th of last year. So that unemployment rate uh, went from about 3.5, 3.6 to 14.7% mm -hmm. over the course of three, four, five weeks. Um, this country has not seen a 14.7% unemployment rate since the 19, late 1930s. I mean, that's how bad it was. And it was really an unprecedented shutdown. We were very fortunate that we had the technology and that many businesses, and, and medium-sized to larger-sized businesses, had the uh, technology to, um, to make changes on the fly. And so a lot of employers were able to keep many of their employees in place. We think this work from home phenomenon is not just a, a flash in the pan during a pandemic. We think this is going to um, be something that has legs for many, many quarters and many, many years. And that has big implications for where people work, where corporations, companies uh, headquarter themselves. It has massive implications for commercial real estate uh, in larger cities. It has massive implications for residential real estate in larger cities. Mm -hmm. Um, migratory patterns might be um, um, uh, changed or, or, or supercharged as people are given the option to uh, work farther away from their corporate headquarters. So um, I think these are playing out in real time. What we're seeing from a numbers perspective is, and it's really not showing up in the numbers, it's showing up in surveys from decision makers at medium sized and larger sized corporations. Uh, these survey data would suggest that, um, you know, these decision makers are allowing more flexibility on where people can work. Okay. And they're starting to answer these surveys of maybe we don't have to have as much floor space in our corporate headquarters as we once did. And we're starting to see from a, a site called the Site Selectors Guild of decision makers at medium and larger size corporations, they're exploring different geographies to put commercial real estate, to put their corporate headquarters. And they're not really in the mega cities that we have in the country. I was about to say, this sounds like it's good for Columbus. So again, you know, I live, in, I live in Cleveland. I'm a Midwesterner, and I, I think there is a possibility. Again, it's too early to tell for sure. There's a possibility that the Midwest, because it has very cheap land, very cheap um, resources, and a well-educated labor force, that there's a possibility that the Midwest could be one of these beneficiaries as this work from home phenomenon continues and corporations start to rethink their corporate footprint and move about. Yeah. Well, one big thing that, uh, one big unique problem uh, that we have here in Ohio is the way that income tax, municipal income tax is assessed. I know Mark and I have talked about this. I put uh, a comment or two on it on my uh, 
uh, Facebook page, the Regionomics LLC Facebook page. Uh, once uh, we get away from taxing people where they used to work and we tax them where they do work, uh, we're going to see big shifts in uh, income tax revenues, uh, not just from the big cities to the suburbs, mm -hmm. but from uh, cities that are job centers to cities that are bedroom communities. Columbus is going to hurt, but uh, my back of the envelope calculation suggested that cities like Dublin are going to hurt too. Okay. Um, Mark, uh, we've discussed uh, uh, personally this idea that, uh, uh, as, as, as Tom pointed out, big companies, big employers, white collar jobs, pretty much made the transition okay. We were still productive, we're still employed, but that's not an equal representation of what is going on in the country. Do you, or do you, what do you think? Uh, first of all, Happy New Year. Happy um, New Year. It is really great to see you guys. I mean, really great <laughs> to see you guys. Uh, I have to say my dog was kind of sad when I walked out of the house today. Um, so we all know what happened this spring. You know, uh, Tom just and, and Bill laid it out very well. Um, you know, businesses shut down, our unemployment rate soared, our GDP, the way we measure our economy fell off a cliff. Um, now we see the economy coming back. You know, Bill and Tom like to use letters like V and U to describe an economic recovery. Well, I learned a new one last year, and that was the letter K. And if you, uh, if you picture the letter K, you have a leg going up and one leg going down. If you are on that leg going up economically, you're doing pretty well and you're managing through the pandemic pretty, you know, doing a good job. If you're on the leg down, you're obviously in that, in that group that's having a harder time. Um, and even before the pandemic, we already knew that there was lots of issues with, um, with income inequality and more and more wealth being concentrated in fewer and fewer hands. Um, the K recovery really has accelerated, I think, what's happened there. Um, you know, we've seen um, this enormous run in the stock market um, over the past six months. It's been extraordinary on how much wealth has been created. Um, we've seen housing values uh, take off and just soar over the past several months. The Federal Reserve says household net worth which is basically all of our assets minus our liabilities, hit a record of $123 trillion last fall. Um, I think my wife and I have survived the pandemic about as well as anybody. Um, our house is worth more, so our, our retirement savings. Um, I've been easily, you know, the top top I've easily been able to make the transition to work from home. Um, I'm saving a ton by not driving to Columbus every day and parking and, and eating lunch out. Um, I got great internet. Um, my, unlike a lot of other people here, my wife and I don't have little children to worry about to make sure that they're getting their education. Um, to be honest, I put on socks today for like the first time in a month. Um, yeah, so there you go. So meanwhile, though, at the same time, we have millions of families throughout the state who are really hurting. Um, they've lost their jobs through all of this or they had to quit their job to take care of family members or kids. Uh, they've lost their income and really struggling to put food on the table and a roof over their heads. And I'm concerned about the uh, evictions that are gonna be coming in, in, in the months ahead. Um, on top of that, we know that a lot of people have struggled to get the one thing that they really needed through all this, and that was to get their unemployment benefits. Uh, this is where I've heard from so many people over the last number of months. I think I've heard from more people who have struggled to get their unemployment benefits um, on this issue than, than anything I've ever written about. And it's and it's really been it's really been difficult, um, and they've been and they've been heartbreaking. Um, and I, I just, and I just wanted to share a couple of these notes very quickly, just so that people can kind of get a feel, so our audience can get kind of a feel for what I'm talking about. Uh, this is one I recently got. Um, I am a single mother. I had to stop working due to COVID and me being pregnant. Uh, my son is four months old. I had him in July. I reluctantly applied for unemployment benefits when my hands became tied due to this pandemic. The emotional distress that I have suffered from applying for benefits, uh, it's, she's referencing the emotional distress that I've had, to, I've suffered from applying for benefits. Uh, and anyway, so she goes on to talk about the issues that people have had, including, I mean, we at the dispatch, we all did furloughs last year, so we can relate to these issues of trying to call um, job and family services and get help. Um, I'm on hold for at least 30 minutes, two hours each time I call. Sometimes I wait on hold for two hours, and when they finally answer the phone, they hang up. 
I've spoken to so many people in regards to my claim, and it's given the runaround, uh, and, and that's all she talks about. This is, this is the holidays and my son's first holiday. I've never experienced it. To, I never experienced it to be going like this. Christmas is around the corner, and I'm trying to find the Christmas spirit. I've been playing this waiting game for 18 weeks now. Um, and she goes on to talk about how um, I need help. I've lost everything, including my home. This unemployment would help me get back on my feet, but I'm in a crossfire. I, I usually work on my own, but having a newborn in the middle of COVID has made it nearly impossible. And then I got one other one here. Um, this is a guy I exchanged notes with for a long time that was really having a struggle getting his unemployment benefits, and then his employer was challenging those benefits um, after, uh, after, he was, after they were approved. Um, so anyway, his health has took a, his, this really affected his health. Um, he ended up in the emergency room. Um, he's concerned I could have heart issues. Um, I just can't blank anymore. I've been fighting for two months straight. I knew my health would go downhill. So as I said yesterday, when I die, please understand this whole process, the waiting, the stress, the pressure of bills piling up, not working, late fees, cash advance, interest and fees, it is all taking a toll on my health. It's not right. So anyway, this is, these are the kinds of emails that I've gotten that I, I think are just absolutely heartbreaking. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not blaming Job and Family Services. Their systems have been overwhelmed yeah. since the very beginning. And even now, we have fewer claims, but our claims are still running five times before the level that they were before the pandemic struck. But I'm just pointing out that these are the difficulties that we have with this, with this with this K recovery that we're experiencing. Um, so that's. Not to put too fine a point on it, but I mean, the three things you mentioned, that, you know, if you're talking about trying to close the wealth gap in this country and in this city, the, the upper class generally have kept their jobs, have seen they're the ones that own houses, they've seen their housing values increase, they're the ones who have retirement accounts and they're seeing their stocks go up, whereas the uh, other half just doesn't have any of those yeah. benefits and it's just getting worse. Um, yeah. It's awful. Yeah. I'm just very fearful of the whole thing and I, um, I'm, I'm not sure, you know, the, 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 stimulus, the stimulus efforts that Congress has enacted have certainly helped keep people afloat. Um, but, you know, there's more that we need to do. Right. People are going to die. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Tom, I want to go back to you for a second. Uh, in our earlier conversation, you uh, said you expect this to be a transition year for the U.S. economy. What do you mean by that? Yeah, um, you know, kind of what we talked about on Monday just for prep for this call is last year was a recession and a pandemic and a fearful year. And this year, I think, you know, when, you know, January or uh, first rolled around, people thought, you know, we're in a brand new year, everything's going to be fine. And unfortunately, I, I don't think that's going to be the case for, for a while. You know, uh, both my um, compatriots up here have been talking about this, um, you know, bifurcated recovery. Um, and, and that's exactly right. So there are lots of industries and sectors of our economy that are doing quite well, whether it's domestic manufacturing, whether it's U.S. housing that we talked a little bit about. Um, you know, there are, you know, this, this at home sector, you know, whether it's work at home, play at home, spend at home, th those industries are doing very, very well. And people that are um, tied to them either tangentially or right in the middle of it, th those individuals and families are doing quite well. But there's this whole sector of the economy like we've been talking about. And, you know, just for a shorthand, we've been calling it kind of the scene of the crime industries. You know, these are the industries that you really can't socially distance from, that you need to be face to face, that you have to do interactions with one another. Um, and it's unfortunately, it's all the things that we also like to to do. It is travel and leisure and hospitality and restaurants and bars and casinos and um, hotels and, and you name it. Th those, those, you, those industries are not coming back. Um, they've gotten a little bit of a lifeline with the CARES Act last year, um, but frankly, not quite enough. You know, we've got an additional stimulus that went by uh, that was passed through Congress in December. Again, a little bit of a lifeline, but probably not enough. Um, you know, I think there's some interesting things potentially happening down in Georgia that might um, allow for some additional stimulus uh, over the next several days and weeks and a month. That, that might help. But there needs to be a little bit of a bridge for the scene of the crime industries to get to where we are today, which is we're not fully functioning um, in those businesses. I mean, I think Bill did a great job talking about leaking and local businesses and the restaurants. And, um, you know, I live in Cleveland and I can see it that there's this whole sector of the downtown Cleveland economy that caters to office workers. And, there's just no office workers in downtown Cleveland. I, I assume it's very similar here in, in sure. Columbus. <clears throat> so there's, there's you know, a three, four, five, six month gap here before most um, of our population will be available to be inoculated. 
And again, you know, I've said this a million times. I never thought I'd have to be an epidemiologist or a virologist, but apparently, you know, that's part of our job description now. <laughs> now. You know, you know, until our country is somewhere between 60 and 80 percent um, either inoculated or people that have antibodies built up from having the disease, I, I don't think it's likely that these scene of the crime industries are going to come back in full force. And then there's one other thing, and I think Bill touched on in his wonderful comments, is that people have to have confidence to go back to restaurants. People mm -hmm. have to have confidence to get on airplanes and spend the night at the Hilton and, and do these things. So again, I, you know, what we're understanding from our government is that these vaccines are coming. You know, most of the population should, should have, um, you know, a, a vaccine available to them sometime in the second quarter of this year. But then people have to go get it. Mm. become inoculated yeah. and feel safe about going back into those scene of the crime industries. And again, I, we just don't see that until far later in 2021. Um, and, yeah. uh, and unfortunately, then those uh, families that are associated with employment mm -hmm. um, and, or, or business owners in those industries, I think there's going to be a struggle ahead. Yeah. And I certainly hope that we don't see the same level of anti-vaccination mm. uh, opposition <clears throat> that we have to masks uh, uh, so yeah. that we can get this, uh, get, you know, yeah, get out I, of this. I'm really hoping that once we actually our news call today yeah. uh, with the dispatch was all about vaccinations yeah. frankly and um the the issues that we're facing uh, with this because it doesn't seem like we were it doesn't, seem, it doesn't seem like we were ready in ohio for the vaccinations no, no. Um, I'm, I'm not sure what this, what's going on there but um i think i'm hoping that that once people start getting the vaccine the people that are reluctant to get the vaccine will then see yeah. that it's going to go better uh, but this is really kind of concerning, though, that that, um, you know, if we were thinking for a bounce back in the economy in 21, um, maybe not so much. So there's a, there's a silver lining here, and this is going to come off as callous. And um, these are just economic numbers. But those senior crime industries that we're talking about, they make up about seven hundred and twenty billion dollars of annual consumer spending. OK. The total annual consumer spend in our country is about eight trillion dollars. So it's about nine okay. percent. You know, again, it's in the news every single day. We see it in our downtowns with uh, shuttered restaurants and bars. It is uh, a meaningful portion of consumer spending. Consumer spending is what really drives our national economy forward. About seventy percent of our economy is driven by people like us that have jobs yeah. uh, and spend that money, or business owners that earn profits and ultimately put those profits back into their local uh, community. It's it's consumer spending that drives our economy forward. So uh, you know. The notion that the scene of the crime industries are about 9% of consumer spending suggests that we're going to see economic numbers this year from a broad national perspective that are going to look great. Okay. But it's exactly what you're talking about. It's a K-shaped yeah. recovery where the haves are going to do extraordinarily well and the have-nots, the scene of the crime industries, are going to struggle until vaccines, herd immunity, and confidence come back. And I, again, it's, it's tough to see that for many, many more months in the yeah, future. Yeah, I mean, you don't see that playing until summer or fall. I think um, at the earliest. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, we may be getting a new presidential administration. I'm pretty sure we are uh, in the next uh, couple of weeks. Uh, Tom, uh, what what can we expect, uh, especially now that uh, uh, you know it's looking like uh, Georgia uh, might actually uh, be both uh, Democratic senators? Well, thanks uh, for putting me on the spot. Dad told me when I was growing up never talk about pol politics and religion. And mixed well, you're, company, an, you're an epidemiologist now, go. and let's, you're a political let's scientist. Jump right into here. Um, <laughs> So this is obviously a little bit in flux. Um, yeah. we, we do feel strongly at Fifth Third that obviously um, uh, President-elect Biden and, and Vice President-elect uh, Harris will be the, uh, the administrations at the executive branch. Yeah. We feel yeah. very strongly about that. Um, it does appear uh, um, that the Democrats have uh, continued with control of the House. We feel yeah. strongly about that. Mm -hmm. And then depending on what happens, again, it, it does appear that the Senate may be um, at a 50-50 uh, lockdown, depending on, again, what happens today. Nothing of course. is yeah. finished. Um, but if you do have uh, all three branches um, um, uh, of government in the Democrats' hands, there will be some changes. Um, so let's let's talk about um, what could happen if that is the final sure. um, decision. Um, so we believe there will be legislative um, regulations uh, that will be enacted from the executive branch. Okay. Uh, we think that um, over the past four years with the Trump administration, uh, it was an about face from the Obama administration where there was far fewer regulations on various industries and sectors uh, re regarding business. Okay. Uh, the three key ones 
um, were less regulations in financial services, fewer regulations in energy, and fewer regulations in health care. And we think that changes under a Biden presidency. Okay. So we think uh, there will certainly be more regulations uh, in energy. There'll be a push for green energy, alternative energies, and there'll yep. be a move away from a disincentive, if you will, away from fossil fuel type energies. Mm -hmm. uh, for financial services, there will likely be um, more regulations for the larger uh, financial services companies. Perhaps you'll have to have more capital on your balance sheets. There'll be more consumer protections. Right. Uh, I think that's probably baked in uh, to the cake with a with a Biden presidency, and then within healthcare. Again, in a divided government, I, I think there'll be a push for lower um, health care and drug costs, but we didn't see sweeping health care changes with a divided government. Maybe, perhaps that changes a little bit. Mm -hmm. But let's not forget, um, again, the Senate still will be, um, you know, 50-50. And again, um, if everybody votes party line, the, the deciding vote will, will come from the vice president, who obviously will be a Democrat. So it'll be easier to enact legislation there, should it go that route. Um, but it's not... Um, let, let's just call it what it is. We are a divided country. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, I think President Biden will have more leeway to get more of his policies enacted if all three um, uh, branches are on his side. But it's not a shoe in that he will get everything that he asked for. And mm -hmm. the final piece, and I'm sorry I'm rambling, mm -hmm. the final piece is if the Senate does flip, um, President Biden will have a better chance of enacting some of his tax policies. And his tax policies will be to raise the statutory corporate tax um, yep. at some rate, repealing some of the 2000, early 2018 uh, tax cuts. Mm -hmm. I think personal tax rates will modestly go higher, but for investors, and that's ultimately what my job for Fifth Third is, is you'll see higher um, dividend income tax rates, you'll see higher capital gains tax rates, and there'll be some changes to how, um, I think, estate taxes are played out in the future. So I think taxes will go higher should uh, mm -hmm. the Democrats have kind of a clean sweep in the, the House, Senate, and the, and the presidency. Sure. Uh, let me ask you both, uh, what is your outlook for manufacturing, uh, which is obviously a key component uh, for Ohio? Tom, you want to go first? Yeah, I'd love to. You know, this is something that we're very bullish on, uh, domestic right. manufacturing. So without going into the, the full preamble, um, over the last four or five years, globally, there's been a, a bit of a shift from a political perspective where the last 20 years were really about globalization and trying to find uh, the, the the most cost-effective place to put a, a plant, you sure. know, cheapest labor, cheapest uh, land, and, and cheapest energy and low, lowest taxes. What we've seen, and it started with Brexit, and it really started with the Trump administration with the 2016 elections, there's been a more of a populist or nationalist political culture globally, especially here. I mean, yeah. you couldn't open up a paper or, or, or read a news headline over the last four years where you didn't hear, make America great again. Right. And over the last six months with the Biden um, administration, you've been hearing, build back better build back all, back, all the yeah. time, right? Yeah. So we think our view is, is that... Um, making America first is a bipartisan um, uh, notion prospectively. What we do think is gonna happen is supply chains that um, we're trying to maximize uh, shareholder value and profits uh, with putting uh, these supply chains in China or Asia or the lowest cost place yeah. in the world. We think a lot of those are gonna come back home because there was massive disruptions in supply chains, first with the US and China trade war in yeah. 2018 and 19. Yep. And then in early 2020, essentially, uh, China shut down in January and February from the pandemic. Yeah. And what we heard over and over again anecdotally from our clients was it was very difficult to get raw materials and finished goods from their uh, plants over in China and Asia during sure. both of those um, tumultuous periods. Right. And what we've seen over the past nine or 10 months is 150 to 170 U.S. firms have said we're bringing some or all of our supply chains back home. So what does this mean going forward? Our view is that... Again, we think it's a bipartisan political um, football that will benefit domestic manufacturing. We do think some of these supply chains are gonna come back home. Mm -hmm. That means jobs are gonna come back home, mm -hmm. and it really should help our economy going forward. I kinda mentioned that um, uh, you know, our economy is really consumer-driven. You know, 70% of our economy is consumer-based. Uh, manufacturing makes up about 12% of our economy, and in Ohio, it's about 17%. Yeah. So to a uh, football analogy, Ohio outkicks its coverage when it comes to manufacturing. <laughs> yeah. We think Ohio will be one of these beneficiaries uh, uh, among the many you know, Midwest industrial uh, states that mm. should this trend of bringing your supply chains back home happen, these areas are poised to, to, to benefit economically. We are very bullish on it. Yeah, so, Tom, that's an interesting point, but I, I mean, but these jobs are not the same jobs as what we think of with manufacturing right. from 20 years ago, absolutely 30 years right. ago. Yes, absolutely right. So the, absolutely. And, and you need, um, 
some kind of training or advanced degree to get a lot of these jobs. At least in Ohio, as of 2019, the manufacturing average wage was in the mid-70s. It was like $76,000, $77,000 versus the rest of um, Ohio's non-farm payroll was in the, the mid-40s. So these mm -hmm. are really good jobs, but you have to be trained in them, and they're not these dirty um, factory-type jobs that you think of in right. you know the 50s and 60s. Right. Um, these are skilled labor jobs. If they, too come, if they do come back, which we expect they will, it, it's really going to benefit, but people have to get trained. And the one thing that we're a little unclear how it's going to happen is there's still a bias against um, yes. um, uh, putting your children into manufacturing-type yes. yeah. sectors. Yes. So we have to almost retrain how we think of how we educate our children, not just go to college and get a degree, but maybe go to a trade school and, and, and learn a trade and then be a, a very readily um, um, have the, uh, the, red, the, the, the skills to go into one of these factories and these high skilled labor factories and working uh, the, the machines or the technological components that are putting together the widgets in these new age factories. So yeah. again, um, it's not going to be easy. We do think there's political will, and uh, this is a trend that we're going to watch for many, many quarters and many, many years, because I think it has lots and lots of legs. Yeah. I, I am forecasting a 2.3% uh, increase in manufacturing for uh, 2021. Um, now, that is conditioned on something very important that we need to remember. Just because manufacturing increases does not mean that jobs will increase. Oh. It's dependent on the rate of technology uptake. Uh, in any case, uh, Ohio and Central Ohio are very durables heavy in our manufacturing, which could work out well as we re continue to recover. But uh, in, whether we get those jobs or not, we'll certainly get the supplier impacts, which are very positive for us. Yeah, even just in central Ohio, not just Ohio sure. as a whole, but uh, sure. central Ohio. Um, we're going to move to questions from our audience in uh, just a few minutes. Uh, we hope to have some live audience questions, uh, even though there's not that many people here today. Uh, but definitely, we're taking questions online from our live stream audience, so make sure you get those in, and we'll get to those in just one second. Uh, first, uh, Bill, uh, I want to go back to your forecast. Your overall number for job growth is 2.6%. Uh, do you expect that to be better or worse than the U.S. overall? About the same. About the same. Um, the, uh, there are two surveys that I look at really closely to see what's going on with uh, U.S. employment growth. I look at uh, the surveys from the Philadelphia Federal Reserve and I look at the survey from the National Association for Business Economics. Both of them are saying about a 2.6, 2.7% employment increase for the U.S. this year. Hasn't Central Ohio tended to lag the uh, overall U.S. job growth? Huh? -uh. No. No. Okay. Um, we did much, much better than average in the uh, in the expansion that recently ended. Um, and uh, lately, our performance in recessions has been less bad, and our performance in uh, expansions has been better. Obviously, that can't happen all the time, mm. because if we grow faster than the economy, we eventually become the economy. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, at least for now, it's looking reasonably okay. Mm-hmm. Kind of a Goldilocks number. With, we're not going to become Seattle anytime soon, but we're also, you know, not going to become Youngstown. Yes. Yeah. Sorry about. No, nothing. Nothing bad. Nothing against to Youngstown. say about Youngstown. No. <laughs> yeah. As a proud Akron native, I'm not going to say anything against Northeast Ohio on this. Um, uh, what uh, What are the implications uh, for our exploding national debt? This one. All right, <laughs> and then I'll. Probably so this is one, this is I think one of the uh, things that keep investors, economists up at night. So yeah. um, you know we've been uh, talking to our clients and saying that uh, what our government did last year to help us get out of the worst of the recession yeah. was extraordinarily positive. You know the Federal Reserve lowered interest rates to zero almost overnight and added liquidity to the system so that borrowers and lenders could enact in a liquid uh, financing market. That yeah. was wonderful. On top of that, Congress, which we know has been very divided for a very long time, um, again, over the course of a long weekend, basically passed the CARES Act, which was fiscal stimulus to the tune of 2.5, 2.6, 2.7 trillion dollars. It's like 15 percent of our overall annual output. So these are just massive numbers. And they were to 
in concert, they were done to kind of build a bridge over this economic chasm Correct. that we had yeah. when we shut everything down back in March. And we were very um, optimistic that the recession would be relatively short-lived. That turned out mm -hmm. to be, I think, true. Um, but now we've got a problem where our government is spending far um, more than it's taking in in tax receipts. Uh, our budget deficit is right around 15 percent on an annual basis. Mm -hmm. That's the highest our budget deficit has been since World War II. Um, and it's really unsustainable over the long periods of time. And when you have lots of government debt, it tends to curtail prospective growth and it brings in the specter of potential future inflation. And if you are potentially opening the door to future inflation and less growth, that is really kind of the harbingers of um, killing an economy over the long periods of, turn, of, of time. I, I will tell you that the optimistic uh, point in me says 10 years ago, coming out of the financial crisis, yeah. we did a lot of the same things. Uh, we've done a lot more this time than we did coming out of the financial crisis, but the budget deficit coming out of 2009, 2010 was about 10%. You mm -hmm. know, it's 15% now. And I just remember seeing an investment committee meeting saying inflation is going to run rampant over the next five, six, seven, eight years. It never happened. Yeah. You know, technology increased. We have an aging demographic. We are a global society. And all of those factors combined kept. Um, price increases under control. Yeah. I think this is a wait and see. So I, I think it's something that keeps us up at night. Let's talk in a year's time and see where inflation is, because yeah. inflation today is still under 2%, mm -hmm. depending on what metric you look at. It has been rising. There's no doubt about that. But inflation will ultimately be the harbinger of slower economic growth going forward. So lots of debt on the government balance sheet is something to watch. Uh, it keeps us up at night, but it's not something to panic about today, in our opinion. Yeah. What, what I would add is that the real problem, the real reason why we're in this mess is that we blew up the deficit during the expansion, which I, th I said at the time was not something that we should have been doing. But now we're in a different world, and what I like to say is when your house is on fire, you don't much worry about your water bill. <laughs> Good point. Okay, uh, it is CMC's tradition to take audience questions. Uh, today, uh, Lainey Cuthbert of CMC is curating questions from our live stream audience. Uh, if you are here in our audience, please remember to keep your uh, microphone time to the question, and we thank you for avoiding editorial comments. Lainey, what is our first question from the audience? We had several that were on the same theme of affordable housing. Mm. Bill Faith and Kathy Fox both asked, home sales are booming, we have an affordable housing shortage, but also a looming pandemic-induced foreclosure and eviction crisis. What interventions are needed to avoid this crisis? Well, that will be our topic coming That's up true. soon, I hope. Um, but. Uh, uh, we really need an interve intervention from the public sector nationally, statewide, and locally to address affordable housing because it really isn't economical for builders to build housing and sell it to uh, a working class population. And so my, my argument would simply be that we really need to uh, step up our uh, support of affordable housing. Okay. Thank you, Bill. Mindy Wright and Lisa Pat McDaniel asked, can you discuss the differences in the economic impact which is related to gender, especially the effect on women in the workforce? Mm. Yeah. Well, women have been her hurt more than anybody mm. by this whole thing. I mean, they, they're the ones that have been stuck with all the, the issues at home, having to deal with the family obligations. Um, Bill, help me out here, but I, I, I think the last labor force participation numbers I've seen have shown a significant decline of women in the workforce. Um, and it's, it's been, it's just been awful that they've had to absorb everything. I spoke to a, a young woman some months ago um, who worked as a um, as a supervisor for a customer service operation here in town, and she um, was trying to manage 20 people while also managing her child from her apartment, and and she was able to do this for a few weeks after the pandemic struck, but eventually she just it was it was it was too much you know, trying to manage that many people and manage your child. And so she finally quit her job. And so this is, this is, this is what's been 
this is what's been the real, I think the real, I, I think we talked a lot about the, the, the Great Recession as being the economy that hurt men um, so much. And now this is the one that I think women have really just been absorbed the bulk of, of what's really awful about this one. Mm. Bill, Bill, I mean, you talked about the, the official unemployment rate, but the official unemployment rate is people who are looking for work. Yes. Right? I mean, so a lot who of these women active, are not. Have, have actively looked for work within the last 30 days. If you want and need a job, but haven't uh, gone to a job fair, uh, and good luck with that in the middle of a pandemic, right. uh, or uh, put in resumes and so forth, uh, you don't count. You don't exist. Mm -hmm. And so the um, I, I track the uh, national statistics and the real unemployment rate that counts these uh, people who are what are called marginally attached also counts the people who are uh, working part-time but want to work full-time. Okay. Uh, that rate uh, last time I looked was north of 11 or 12. Right. Mm. Okay. Yeah. So, so this is this is just one just one more point on on all this. Um, if it, one of our guys that I'm working with is is working on a story about how um, restaurants actually for the jobs that they have available um, have had difficulty filling filling some of these jobs, and and I'm trying to think about you know these some of these jobs. And I'm thinking you know. Um, if I've got, if I'm taking care of family at home, do I want to go out and expose myself to getting sick and bringing that home, uh -huh. and 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 you know, getting mom and dad sick or getting my child sick, and and I and I and I think about all that stuff, and I and I, you know, it's it's again, I mean, the, our from our previous point, these th this is just so difficult for I, I don't I do not envy the people having to make those dis those kinds of decisions that they have to make. Along those lines, Charles Lynn asks, given the persistence of poverty, lack of affordable housing, so many low-wage jobs, do you see any indication that local governments will move beyond public-private partnerships and intervene directly to impose a minimum wage requirement for our employees? Okay. Um, it's a political question, I, I, you know. Uh, uh, yeah, I, well, I mean, um, it is a very complex uh, issue. It is more complex than a lot of people think. I've seen analyses that say we boost the uh, minimum wage to 15 bucks, we lose all of our low wage jobs, and other analyses that say we lose none of them. And we simply don't know what the impact is going to be. But uh, Chuck's question was, do you think that, uh, that we'll see that? Um, who knows? <laughs> yeah. you know, this, I used to really, this question used to always kind of make me crazy um, because when you think about um, um, how, how low the minimum wage is, and how and how you how you you just can't you just can't do anything with it, and so but on the other hand you do think about well if he's just said at fifteen dollars you know businesses will do businesses will react to that um, in some way that probably may be fewer jobs in some areas and of course you know we see a lot of other places that that um, um, even have gotten above fifteen dollars for their minimum wage for their for their company I mean some of the companies that I write about um, have have set wages that are I mean even I think fifth third what. It, what are you guys up to for your minimum wage now? I think it's they raised it last year quite a bit. Yeah, I, I don't know the exact number. Seventeen or eighteen dollars, or 18 dollars an hour. Yeah. Yeah. So, so some companies have done this on their own. I don't know what the solution is to that. I, I, I just think uh, that um, it, whatever the minimum wage is now, it's just not. It's not even. Yeah. It's mm -hmm. ridiculous. I, I think. I think you know just to put a fine point on it is, given the political. Um, and, and social ills that this country is experiencing today, I, and the notion that these questions keep popping up, I do believe that there'll be more uh, will from local, state, and national governments to address this issue in, in the environment that we're in today. Does it mean that uh, this issue is going to get solved? Mm. You know, th that's that's a guess. We don't know, but my guess is, um, given that these questions are coming up, and, and given where we are coming out of a very brutal recession, mm -hmm. I, I think they're going to be uh, bandied about in state, local, government houses, and yeah. um, perhaps that could be. Something 
something that will, uh, again, build a, a bit of a gap here until, again, later on this year where maybe we're inoculated and business confidence comes back and people are feeling better go to, into, um, you know, bars, restaurants, hotels. Well, and, and, and I also get, too, that, that when you, whenever you talk about raising the bottom, that <clears throat> didn't, business also didn't have to be raising mm -hmm. some of the other wages That's as right. well at, at some of its company. And I, and I, I get that, too. I just, I just, I'm in my chair for a reason, and I, and so I, that other reason, I don't know. I can't solve it. I just know I look at it and go, Dah! Yeah. All right, I think we have time for one more question. Okay, Maybe? this is a quick one. Well, maybe <laughs> that's a quick one. <laughs> Jaron Terry asks, do you feel the long-term negative economic effects of the pandemic will affect one segment or industry more than another, housing or higher education, healthcare, for example? Yes. So who's going to get hardest hit? Um, I, I, I come back to uh, arts, entertainment, recreation, um, uh, restaurants, hotels. Um, they've, they have been hit mightily. And um, a lot of the infrastructure is going away. And uh, so that's going to be a long, slow climb back. And it, it won't emerge the same as it was before 2020. That's for sure. Business models will have to change to react to this new normal. That's what's right. going to happen, I think. Yeah. Right. Wow. Well, we certainly have raised as many questions about what uh, normal is going to look like than we've answered maybe today and certainly a sobering report. Uh, but there are some similar, silver linings, and thank you for sharing some of those things, too. And obviously, we all have to stay safe and continue to take COVID say, very seriously for an uh, extended period of time. Um, I heard lots of things, though, about a transition year and a time to rebuild confidence. So let's get to work on that. We can, we can all work on those kinds of things. So um, please join us next week as we have a conversation addressing the digital divide with Lieutenant Governor John Husted and dispatch reporter um, Celie Doyle and several other panelists. Thanks for the live stream support today presented by the Emergency Response Fund from the Columbus Foundation and the Columbus Dispatch and PNC, and from our sponsors today, BDO and Fifth Third Bank. And again, once again, let me thank those of you who purchase virtual seats. You really are keeping us online, and we couldn't be more grateful for your support. We'd also like to say a special thanks, obviously, to our speakers, Dr. Bill Lafayette in his 20th year at the Columbus Metropolitan Club. Thank you, Bill. Um, Tom uh, Jolick, who is his first time on our CMC uh, economic report. Thank you. Thank you. Mark, Mark Williams from the Dispatch and Doug Buchanan from Business First. Thanks to our speakers. Thank you all. We look forward to you tuning in again next week, and in the meantime, continue to stay safe and be well. Thank you so much.